Today's scripture lesson is in the gospel according to John. This is the 15th chapter, and I'll pick it up in verse 9. In these chapters of the gospel of John, Jesus is spending some time with his disciples one last time before his crucifixion. These are sort of his final remarks to them. And this is a beautiful, beautiful section of the gospel. I'm only going to read one small part of it. <clears throat> Pick up in verse 9. This is Jesus saying to his disciples, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends, because I've made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I've had three hopes for this series, three goals in mind as we've talked about the atonement. The first is just to kind of appreciate over these five weeks just how significant this idea is. It's a very, very bold, audacious thing to say, Jesus died for me. Jesus died for us. Other religions have ideas about the atonement, but Christianity says Jesus is the one who died for us to forgive our sins. It's, it's, a, it's an earth-changing idea, and I hope we've kind of realized that during this series. The other thing is to realize that, that even though we have a, a fundamental idea of Christianity, there are a lot of different ways to think about that. In other words, the Christian faith is a diverse expression, and it always has been. Diversity in our religion is a strength. It's a character of who, of, of who the church has always been. I mean, think about it. Even in our holy book, even in our scriptures, we have four different versions of the story of Jesus' life. We didn't try to mush all those together. We left all four of them as they were. And by the way, mush together is a technical term. Probably didn't understand it. But um, no, we left all four versions of the story in there. Diversity in our faith is important because it draws us together to learn from one another. The third thing I hope we learned in this series is that theology isn't just an academic exercise. That there are pragmatic implications of our theology. We've been doing some pretty deep, pretty intense theology throughout this series, talking about the atonement and these different theories. But we didn't just leave it in the abstract. I'm hopeful that every week we took something home, something that shaped us and formed us. We've talked about four theories so far. We have one more to talk about today. There are others that we're not going to be able to get to during this series. But the one we're going to talk about today is called the moral example theory or the moral influence theory. Boring, right? I mean, I am sure some professor somewhere thought of that one. Moral example so instead of using its technical boring term, I'm going to encourage us to just think about what it really is all about. This is a theory of the atonement that is all about love. Because as we well know, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of what the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, 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 not just for some, but for everyone. I know most of you are like, 
I wasn't alive when that song came out, but... <laughs> This, this is an idea of the atonement that is centered on love, particularly the crucifixion as an act of love, an act of love that is so divine, so profound, so mysterious and miraculous that it actually changes us. It actually changes who we are. The moral influence, our moral example gives us the paradigm for how we are to live. Sin, in this view of the atonement, is the absence of love. Distance away from God, that is the absence of love. Jesus' act of love pours so much abundance of love into the world that we are reconciled with God. It's an old, old theory. It goes all the way back to the Gospel of John. The early church in the first and second centuries, those theologians talked about it. But in its fullest form, it came to be in the medieval times with a guy whose name is Peter Abelard. He's usually credited as being the one to most fully express this particular idea. He writes, for example, our redemption through Christ's suffering is that deeper love in us which not only frees us from slavery to sin, but also wins for us the true liberty of children of God, so that we do all things out of love rather than fear. Love to him who has shown us such grace that no greater can be found. As he himself asserts, saying, greater love than this has no man that a man lay down his life. For his friends. In that, Peter is quoting John chapter 15, the passage that I read just a little bit ago. Jesus is saying goodbye to his friends. This is the last time they will be together in this world prior to his crucifixion. It's as if he's saying, look guys, we've been together for a long time. I've said a lot of stuff. I've done a lot of things. You've seen me. You've heard me. If you remember nothing else, from what I've said and done, would you please just try to love each other? How about that? How about just try to love each other? Love each other like I have loved you. If you ask me about the crucifixion of Jesus, I would tell you that I believe the crucifixion of Jesus is the most mysterious, most miraculous, deepest, most profound expression of God's love that ever has been. If you ask me about the crucifixion, I would tell you that I believe it is a love that is so powerful that it actually opens itself up to the pain of this world. It's a love that opens itself up to grief, to evil, to death itself, and in that opening becomes vulnerable, but in that opening, also is able to embrace all of that pain and grief and evil and death itself, and by embracing it, overcome it. That's the crucifixion. At the same time, I believe the crucifixion to be a political act enacted by the authorities who were threatened by a, a dissident in their day, and so they had to get rid of them. I believe that to be true as well. I don't have to reconcile those two. It's both of those things. If you ask me, what does the crucifixion mean to you? I would say it means a mother who is standing next to her son and watching him die. The, the cross of Jesus we need to clear up something that we don't understand always about the cross of Jesus because almost every time we see the cross of Jesus depicted, it's like 10, 12 feet up in the air. You don't have to be an engineer to know that's impossible. The crosses that were used at the time, the, the vertical piece was already in the ground. The person being crucified carried the crossbar, but the, the vertical piece was already in the, in the ground, and that crossbar was lifted by the soldiers and set on top of that vertical piece, which means the vertical piece is somewhere between six and eight feet tall. Let's say seven. Let's say it's seven feet high. Jesus' arms are seven feet high. Is he ten feet up in the air? How 
tall is he? Would you help me illustrate this, Laura? Can you come up here? If his hands are seven feet in the air, that means he's only like a foot and a half, maybe two feet off the ground as he hangs on the cross. And that means as his mother is standing there watching him, they are quite literally eye to eye as he dies. What's the crucifixion? It's a mother standing eye to eye and watching her son die. Why did Jesus have to do all that? What's the point of all of that? Jesus had to show us that with that level of power, with that level of everything, to show us exactly what love means. Because if he hadn't have shown us if all he did was tell us without actually showing us, you know, we wouldn't get it, to be honest with you. We would think he was just speaking in metaphor. We would think he was just being symbolic. But he wanted us to know what love looks like, and so he showed us. And why is it important for Jesus' followers to know what love looks like? Why does Jesus want us to know that? Well, it's because Jesus wants every single person everywhere in the entire world to know that they are loved just like that. And he is entrusting us to show them. He wants everyone to know just how deeply they are loved and he wants you and me to be the ones to show them he wants the church to show that love so we had to know we had to see we had to be loved that deeply this this picture is an image of piles of shoes in the train station in budapest Hungary. The people of Budapest brought their shoes to the train station and left them there when they realized that there were going to be people who had walked there from Syria, refugees from the violence in their own country, who probably might need some shoes. And so they left them there. A tangible expression for the benefit of another person, a stranger they would never even meet. On the BBC website this morning, there was a video of, of uh, the train station in, I think it was Munich, Germany, and Munich people are there, and, and when Syrian refugees get off of the train, they are greeted with applause and bottles of water, and there are little German children holding bowls of candy, <laughs> and little Syrian children see that. And they come up and they take candy out of the bowl and they smile at each other and pa, ah, love for the sake of another person without expecting anything in return, without even wanting gratitude, just letting another person know that they are loved just because. That's our job. That's what we do. And we needed to know just how deeply we needed to express that love. Hmm. We get that gift. We, we, we get that unexpressible gift of love. And, and our first inclination is to love Jesus back. When someone loves you, you want to return it. When someone loves you, you want to say, thank you so much. Let me love you in return. But here's the befuddling, infuriating part of being a follower of Jesus. He doesn't want us to love him back. He doesn't want us to love him back. Do you want to express your gratitude for the love you have been shown? Show that same love to others. When you are loving them, you are thanking me, says Jesus. How will they know that you're my followers? If you're doing the things I told you to do. And what did he tell us to do? Love one another. And how are we supposed to love one another? The same way he loved us. And what does that look like? It looks like laying down your life for someone else. And we can rationalize, and we can think he was talking in metaphors, and we can think symbolically, and we can theologize all we want to, but unless we are loving others in the same way Jesus loves us, we're doing it wrong. 
you want to express your gratitude to Jesus, love someone else. Every word, every action, every look, everything you say and do, an expression of divine love, a love that you've felt, a love that you've known, a love that you have received. That love urges us on. That love pushes us and directs us and guides us and urges us on, for we are convinced that one has died for all. And what that means is that all have died. And now those who have died live. But we live not for ourselves. We live for the one who died and who rose for our sake. What the world needs now is love. Thanks be to God that we have that to offer, to give, to share. That's the, the, the Lord that we serve. That's the, the God that we profess to believe in. That's the Jesus that calls us. When we unite in a historic affirmation of faith like the Apostles' Creed, we are saying, yes, I believe in that level of love, in that depth of love. And so please, as you are able, would you stand up with me? And using the words of the Apostles' Creed that will be on screen behind me or in your hymnal, number 881, let us affirm our faith in the God of love. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen.